Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, AP English, and our objective for the hour now is to come back to the work of Shelley. I made observations yesterday at the conclusion of my lecture in regards to defense of poetry, and uh, now we're going to come back. One way to think about what we will try to accomplish now this hour is to ask, can we apply the principles of defense of poetry to Shelley's Ode to the West Wind and Skylark? Okay. Uh, we'll look at both of them in succession. The other thing I think I said to you in terms of helping you prep for the examination is to identify 10 p uh, key pieces of information from Ode to the West Wind. Again, five different parts. Within each one of those parts, two important pieces of information. One, what specifically, and that's a key word you want to underline, what specifically is identified in regards to wind in that part? And then two, what is the request that is made by, let's go ahead and say it, Shelley the speaker of the poem? We'll begin then with part one. O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being. Let's point out the west wind then is which wind? The wind of the fall or the wind of the spring? It is. It's the autumn wind. It's the wind of the fall, right? Thou from whose unseen presence the leaves dead are driven. Notice the interesting Shelley similes of this poem. I'm pointing this out for the exam as well. There are a number of important similes, like or as comparisons. Each one of them, obviously, you want to write down. This is the first one. Notice what is the emphasis in part one. The leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing. It's an interesting simile, the way that the wind in the fall blows the leaves. Yellow, black, and pale, and hecate red, pestilence-stricken multitudes. O thou who cheritest to their dark wintry bed the winged seeds, where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave. Notice your second simile, right? Until thine azure sister of the spring shall blow. You'll remember that this is, uh, this is Chaucer's um, um, Zephyrus wind, right, of the spring. Her clarion over the dreaming world and fill driving sweet buds like flocks to feed in air with living hues and odors plain and hill. So what is it that what is it that's being signified here in regards to the wind? Jot it down. The wind does what in the first part? What is significant about the wind here? It does what? What does it do? What is specifically? Yeah, it 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 blows the leaves. It takes seeds and it puts them somewhere, right, so that they germinate. And in the spring, right, all those seeds reawaken for new life, okay? So the first emphasis is what the wind will do in the fall to the leaves. Wild spirit, which aren't moving everywhere. Look what he calls the wind, destroyer and preserver. How is it, in, within the context of this for part, how is it a destroyer? How is it a destroyer within the context of this first part? Destroyer in what way? It, yeah, it takes the leaves literally right off the tree branches. How is it a preserver? Yeah, pre preserves the seeds, right, for new growth in the spring. Okay? That's, what it, that's now what's focused. I told you there's two things in each part. That's what's focused in terms of the wind. What is his request to the wind? Part one, hear, oh, hear. Uh, meaning what? What does that mean, hear, oh, hear? He's, he's telling the wind what? Listen. Yeah, listen to me. I got something I need to tell you. Listen to me. Or more particularly, as we hit part four, part five, I have, I have a request to make. All right, part two. Thou on whose stream... Mid the steep sky's commotion, loose clouds, notice another simile. Like earth's decaying leaves are shed, shook from the tangled bough of heaven and ocean, angels of rain and lightning. Uh-oh, what's the focus here? If the first one is on leaves, what's the wind do in the second part? Yeah, we've got weather, don't we? Notice rain, lightning. Um, they are spread on the blue surface of thine airy surge, like the bright, another simile, like the bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce menad, even from the dim verge of the horizon to the scene its height, the locks of the approaching storm. It's an interesting extended word picture. Clouds, it'll be the focus here, obviously. Thou dirge of the dying year, to which this closing night will be the dome of a vast sepulcher, 
vaulted with all thy congregated mida vapors, from whose solid atmosphere black rain and fire and hail will burst. Where does hail and rain all of this come from? Obviously from the clouds. Our focus in part two is that the wind moves the clouds. And of course, by extension, the weather, right? I mean, uh, so, much of, so much of England is about clouds. Uh, for those of you who need lots of sunshine, England is not the place for you to go and live for large parts of the year because it is rainy and cloudy a lot. Of course, a lot of that has to do with the fact that it sits right next to an ocean and lots and lots of water comes uh, onto England because of all that. All right, what is it that he requests in the second one? The same thing again. Oh, here. So again, the same thing, a different emphasis. And now to the third one. Uh, now, this is problematic if you don't know the Mediterranean. One of the reasons why you'll want to graduate is so you can travel. And one of the places that you'll want to travel is to the region around the Mediterranean. This is easily seen, for example, if you visit the city of Athens. The Mediterranean is an interesting body of water. For those of you who don't remember it with a map, look it up or Google it the next time you get a chance to see it. What's fascinating about the Mediterranean is that there is no outlet for that water. In other words, it's like a small, do you remember when you were a kid, they would fill up those small swimming pools with water, and then somebody who was strong enough, if the water was inside of the pool, somebody who was strong enough could come and lift the side of the pool and then drop it? What happened to the water? If you dropped the, if you dropped the side of a pool like that, what happened to the water? it would begin to displace, right? Why? Because there's no place for it to go, correct? It's like a bathtub where there's no place for the water to go. You'll want to put this in your notes. The Mediterranean is like a bathtub. It's like a big bathtub. Literally, there's no place for the water to go once the wind starts blowing, which is what makes the Mediterranean Ocean so unbelievably dangerous. You can get a small wind and it will produce serious size waves. The reason is obvious. There's no place for the, way, for the water to go, right? Now, for those of you who saw Perfect Storm, you know all about what the water and wind can do in the Atlantic, right? Okay, the size of waves in the Atlantic and, of course, in the Pacific can be prodigious as well because of the wind. So here our focus now is going to be on what wind does when it meets water. And of course, we're playing the same game Wordsworth was playing in, the world is too much with us. This sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours and are gathered now like sleeping flowers. It's a weird thing, the ocean. It can be so still, it looks like you could go out and walk on it like it's a mirror. And then all of a sudden, the wind comes along and it can begin to make those waves get really big, especially in that area between England and France what we call the channel, that body of water in between, it also can get really, I mean, it, it, when you're in a boat at certain times of the year out on the channel, it can be very dangerous. Of course, some of you have spent time on our Boysen Reservoir water in the late afternoon in July, and you know what it's like if a wind comes along even there. I mean, we're not talking about large, you know, necessary waves, but waves big enough to take a lot of boaters off the water. They're like, yeah, I don't want to capsize my boat you can kind of exponentially uh, you know, increase that with the Mediterranean, that's where he's going. Thou, part three. Who didst waken from his summer dreams the blue Mediterranean where he lay, lulled by the coil of his crystalline streams, beside a pumice isle and by his bay, I'll let you read your sidebar for that one, and saw in sleep old palaces and towers quivering within the waves in tensor day. It's a cool word picture. When these waves start to happen in the Mediterranean, they get so high, he says, that the bottom of the wave almost goes to the bottom of the Mediterranean and allows you to be able to see Atlantis, the sunken island that, at least reportedly, was in the Mediterranean. Okay, it is, uh, it, it's, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, image in the mind, right? All overgrown with azure moss and flowers, so sweet, the same... 
the sense faints picturing them. Thou for whose path the Atlantic's level power, so our second body of water here mentioned. Again, for those of you who know Perfect Storm, you know all about 75, 80, 90, even 100 foot waves in the Atlantic. Of course, it kind of makes sense because while the Atlantic is a large ocean, it's not as large as the Pacific. In other words, you have a similar kind of effect where you don't have a lot of place for the water to go once serious amounts of wind start happening. And so you can have these really large waves. I saw a video the other day of a guy who supposedly now has broken the surfing record with a 100-foot wave. Maybe some of you caught that one as well. Uh, it, you, can, you can go to YouTube and see this. A guy is actually surfing a 100-foot wave, and he drops into the wave, and it's being videotaped from a helicopter, and they have a clearly powerful you know, kind of uh, uh, scope that allows them to come in on the guy so that you actually are watching him, and he just looks like a normal surfer until they start panning back, 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 and then all of a sudden you realize from perspective, this cat's on a 100-foot wave. You can't see him once they pan all the way back, but you can hear the force of the water at 100 feet. You can, you can imagine. I mean, a wave the size of our building at 30 feet is going to, for most of us, frighten whatever life is in us out of us, okay, at 30 feet. And you've got to be a pretty good surfer to be able to handle 30-foot waves. Anything beyond that usually is constituted as giant waves. All of that comes from, of course, the wind, okay? The wind generates a lot of that, so this is his point. Notice he will continue in regards to the Atlantic's level powers. Cleave themselves into chasms while far below the sea blooms and the oozy woods which wear the sapless foliage of the ocean know thy voice and suddenly grow gray with fear and tremble and despoil themselves. It's a funny word picture. When the wind starts moving, the ocean pees itself. That's what despoil here means. The ocean gets frightened of the wind, and in that moment, it can actually pee itself in fear. All right, so notice, just to backtrack, part one, emphasizing the blowing of leaves and seeds. Part two, emphasizing the movement of the clouds in regards to weather. Part three, the way that the wind is able to move huge bodies of water. What is it that's requested in the third? One more time. Listen to me. I have something to say. It will be Shelley's request to the wind that will become, of course, the ode to the west wind. Part four. If I were, and then notice here, you've got the recapitulation of what is being focused on in each one of the previous three parts. If I were a dead leaf, thou might despair. If I were a swift cloud, to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power, and share the impulse of thy strength only less free than thou, uncontrollable. Let's go ahead and say it in our notes. Shelley is going to identify with the wind in some pr really provocative way. Like a child, he imagines what it would be like to be a leaf blown by the wind. Or like a child, he imagines what it would be like to be a cloud blown, or to be a body of water pushed around by the way, by the ear, right? And share the impulse of thy strength only less free than thou, O uncontrollable. If even I were as in my boyhood. Now, this is a very romantic idea. Romantics liked to go back and to reminisce about their childhood. They enjoyed thinking about what it was like to be a child. Notice what he says about when he, was a, when he was a boy. And could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven. Some of you probably did, maybe most of us, maybe all of us did this at some point, probably you've forgotten doing it, where you just laid back on your back on a summer's day and watched clouds move through the, the sky. And you imagined maybe what it would be like to be one of those clouds. This is a very childlike activity. He's reminded of it, right? And then, when to outstrip strip the sky's speed, scarce seemed a vision, I would ne'er have striven as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need. Now an interesting line, and it's now going to take us to the end of the poem. Oh, lift me as a wave, notice the inversion of the order here, a, light, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. Put in your notes, what do you think it is that he's saying? He's no longer a child, obviously. And he says, as an adult, he falls upon the thorns of life. He bleeds. What is the word picture here? 
What are the thorns of life? To what is he in reference, can you imagine? Is he just saying that life's hard? To what degree is life hard? Why is, the, why is life hard? He has fallen on the thorns of life. Because you're not a cloud. Right. You're not those things which are free to move wherever. Life is like a rose, beautiful, and yet possesses thorns. What is he saying about his life as of, as of late? He wrote this, by the way, just a few days before he would ironically drown in a storm on a body of water because of lots of wind. There's some dark irony about that, right? He says about his life, I fall upon the thorns of life, I bleed. He'll explain it. Look at the next two lines. And this will sound very much like Wordsworth's observation about what sometimes life has meant for him. A heavy weight of ours has chained and bowed one too like thee, tameless, swift, and proud. Um, some of us have that sense uh, that, especially right about now as we're finishing our senior year, that life is like this heavy burden. It just keeps kind of pushing us down further and further, and we've got more to do, and you've got adults in your life who are asking you the same repetitive question over and over again, have you done whatever it is, X, Y, Z, and uh, would you just leave me alone? I need more time. This is the burden, he says. I, I feel a heavy weight pressing down on me. Notice there is not a direct invocation to the wind in this, in this one, unless you wish to argue that it is a, a call to somehow be freed of the burden, to be made a leaf, a cloud, a body of water, a wave. Part five. Make me thy lyre. Now, lyre here is our word guitar. We would say guitar. Even as the forest is. Now, I've, I often have conversations with my colleagues who don't live out west, and they will say things like, how can you live out there and teach? And I have often said to them, well, there are lines I can teach because they understand things your, your students who live in cities do not understand. Really, give me one example. And I'll always reference, well, part five of Ode to the West Wind. When Shelley will say, make me thy liar as, see it, the, the, another simile, as the forest is. Uh, those of us who live out here, who have spent any time, especially in October, in the mountains, know what it's like to be sitting in a spot when far, far away, you can actually hear the wind blowing through the trees and you can hear it moving towards you. Here it comes, here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. Now it's here, now it's past, now it's going to the other. I, I explain this to my pals who live in cities and they're like, yeah, right, whatever. And I'm like, no, this is for real. You can hear it. Really, what does it sound like? It sounds like LA's Highway 2 in the middle of rush hour. That's what it sounds like. Or downtown Houston's interstate. And they're like, no way. And I'm like, you're right. It's louder than that. It can sound, if it's a good, powerful wind, it can sound like a choo-choo train coming. And it's really loud. And then it comes from far, far, far away. But it can meet you in just a matter of seconds. And then it passes you. And then it's all the way. And then it's gone. And then you're back to still again. And they'll kind of look at me and roll their eyes. But I say this to students all the time. They're like, uh, yeah, and it gets dark at night too. Anyone that's spent any time in the woods in October, November, knows about this kind of wind. This is the point that he's making. He asks the wind to turn him into a forest where there is a sound or a song. Keep going. Make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. What if my leaves are falling like its own? Interesting. He predicts. My leaves are already falling off my tree. He's getting ready to go. The tumult fight of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autonomous tone, sweet though in sadness. And now all of a sudden you'll see that we're joining all kinds of romantic ideas. Remember at the end of Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, he goes away wider, but he, wiser, but he also goes away what? Do you remember? Sadder. Notice here. The romantic intuition is when you really appreciate life by understanding Ruthie's tree, it is an amazing thing that makes you go, yeah, how did Ruthie's tree know to grow up to look like that instead of a Christmas tree? And on and on we can ask those philosophic questions. But one of the disturbing realizations is that the difference between you and Ruthie's tree is that Ruthie's tree, at least we imagine it, does not know that it's going to lose its, its leaves every year. Right. Uh, we, on the other hand, are aware that if our life is a tree, pretty soon the leaves got to fall. And we're aware of that. 
And in that moment, not only is there a certain kind of realization and appreciation of life, but there's also kind of a sadness that the tree, sooner or later, no matter how magnificent it is, sooner or later the tree's got to go away. It can't live forever. And in that moment, there's a sadness as well, as he points out. Be thou, now he's ready to finish his poem and speak directly to the air, to the wind. Be thou spirit fierce, my spirit. Be thou me, impetuous one. If Shelley had to have one thing out of nature that kind of described him, and that's always an interesting question. I like to ask it at 3A. If you had to pick one thing out of nature to describe you, it has to be natural. It cannot be man-made. And you would say about that one thing, more than anything else, that describes me and who I am. Shelley says it would be the west wind, the wind of the fall that does all those things to leaves, that does all those things to the weather and the clouds, that does all those things to bodies of water. Be thou me, spirit fierce, my spirit. He says, be thou me, impetuous one. And then a most remarkable request. Look at it. Drive my dead thoughts over the universe. Another simile. Like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. And by the incantation of this verse, scatter as from an unextinguished hearth, a little bit of coal, not quite completely put out, ashes and sparks, my word, among mankind. It's almost as if Mr. Kelleher, Mr. Shelley, anticipated your question. Why do we got to read this poem? Imagine for a moment, Shelley is sitting on a rock next to a body of water, and he was, when he's in his little notebook writing these words. And as he gets to the end, he asks the wind, I would like for you to pick up my words and to throw them across the universe where they will land and create new birth somewhere in the future far, far away. Of course, what's fascinating about this is you're reading the poem. Uh -huh. And Shelley goes, oh, thank you to the West Wind one more time. You're reading the poem. And what is it that he would want to say to us through his words? What is it that will bring this new life to us? The trumpet of a prophecy. O oh, wind, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? What is the question and what is the rhetorical observation being made here at the end of the poem? If Shelley wants to teach you one thing from 1800, his words are picked up like ashes from a fire that didn't quite get completely put out, swept across and dropped somewhere to start a new fire. We're familiar with the way fire often gets started this way, huh? His word picture is, I want to send my words across the universe to 20, why not, 13, where a bunch of high school seniors will be sitting and they read this poem. What is it that I want them to know that will allow for new life to begin? And it comes in the form of a question. If winter come, can spring be far behind? In your own words, Put down what it is that Shelley wants you to know. And if you get it, then the wind has done its job. And Shelley is one more time rewarded with his request. Man, I'd love to write something that a whole bunch of years later, somebody can read and it awakens them again to new life. What does it mean if winter comes, can spring be far behind? What's the point of that? What do you think, what do you think is the point, Ms. Eves? What's the message? If winter come... Can spring be far behind? Well, I guess if you want to go back to the leaves, if they're going to die, they're going to, the seeds are going to sprout. Right? right. This is that recapitulation of life, huh? And no matter how bad it gets in the winter, and we're familiar with that, aren't we? Right? Sooner or later, you always know spring is coming, which is to say, no matter how bad it gets, right? Very romantic idea. Don't ever lose hope. Shelley would want to say to you, it's going to seem really bad at times in your life. Don't give up. Because sooner or later, no matter how bad winter is, 
What defines winter? Well, winter is defined as that which precedes spring. Spring's got to come. No matter how bad it is, there will come a moment when it's not so bad anymore. At least that's the hope. All right, let's turn now to a skylark. <clears throat> In defense of poetry, Shelley said, a poet takes simple things and makes you, the reader, see them again a different way. Now, right about this time of the year, and I love to teach this poem right about this time of the year, our birds in the morning are starting to grow active. And some of us are familiar with this because they get so stinking loud, they can actually wake us up. I've had students that say, I cannot sleep in the, in the morning because these stupid birds all sit outside my window and they start singing. Have you noticed something about birds? Think about this, I hope to blow your mind. Have you noticed something interesting about birds? If I were to ask, for example, Mr. Schreiber, to come up here right now and start screaming loud enough that his voice could be heard down by the library. By the way, he could do this if I had doors open especially. He could do this loud enough, right? But what would we know about Schreiber's voice after a few minutes of doing that? If I told him, I need you to talk loud enough that with my door open, people standing right outside the library can hear your voice. He could do that. His voice is powerful enough to do that, but only for a few minutes. Agreed? After a few minutes, his vocal cords would begin to fatigue. And after even more minutes, he would literally have to stop. He couldn't do it anymore. Ironically, that's a huge, a huge man doing that. Ironically, have you noticed something about birds? They have a little, little tiny set of vocal cords, and they will start singing and never friggin' shut up. <laughs> they keep going and going and right. Why well, you go mariner on them? <laughs> right. Right. You want to. Sometimes you even want to. You you even want to crossbow one of them. Right. They keep. Uh, question. How about this one? If I were to call, I don't know, let's just say it, Miss Anderson up to the front of the room, and I would just say, I want you to start singing. Now, uh, some of us like to sing, and so we would start singing, right? But probably one of the questions would be, what do you want me to sing? And I would say, well, I don't care, sing anything. The next question would probably be, like, why do you want me to sing? Oh, I don't know, just sing just because. And some of you are familiar with that. I'm just happy, so I'm going to start singing. Question, why do birds sing? Really? I mean, in the early morning when Mr. Schreiber's ready to go all, you know, jack the albatross on these birds, the obvious philosophic question, it's an intriguing one, maybe we should bring Miss Barnes in and she would have enlightenment for us, is why do these birds sing in the first place? There they are in the early morning sitting on their little branch and they all start singing. Like what is going on with this song of the bird? Observation now for Shelley. Shelley says, I like to take simple questions that everyone kind of rolls their eyes about because they're so simple, like, why can a bird sing forever and not get tired? And why does a bird sing at all? And he likes a question like that, and then he writes a poem about it. He writes a poem directly to the songbird, to the skylark. And it runs something like this. I'm on page 853. Hail to the blithe spirit, happy, happy spirit. Bird, thou never wert that from heaven or near it pours thy full heart in profuse strains of unpremeditated art. There's no singing school for birds. They don't have to go to music lessons. They don't have to go to schools where they're taught how to sing. And yet Shelley says it's quite amazing. They all sing. Higher and still higher. By the way, for those of you who are prepping for the exam, each one of these stanzas, he, in, he injects something about the bird that's quite remarkable. If you know all of them, then you'll be fine, especially his similes. Higher and still higher from the earth thou springest like a cloud of fire. Notice all the similes in this. If you know the similes of this poem, you'll be fine for the exam. Like a cloud of fire, the blue deep thou wingest and singest, still does soar and soaring ever singest. In the golden lightning of the sunken sun, or which clouds are brightening, thou dost float and run like an unbodied joy whose race is just begun. The pale purple even melts around thy flight like a star of heaven in the broad daylight. Thou art, thou art unseen, 
but yet I hear thy shrill delight. It will not happen today because our weather does not allow it. But three different times in my study of this poem and teaching of this poem, the weather has been amicable enough that our windows were open, and three different times I've had a bird that came and sat in that tree and started singing while I was reading this poem. The last time happened with Nani and that group, and it was so loud, you can ask Sam Compton, I literally had to stop reading. It, was, it reverberated because all my windows were open. And of course, the courtyard allows the amplification of the sound as a bird sat right on Ruthie's branch there and started singing so loud that during that year, at least, I stopped. I looked up. I took off my spectacles and said, please continue. Why would we read about it when we can hear it? And in that moment, one or two of us recognized the power of what Shelley was saying in his defense of poetry, something as simple, as obvious as the song of a bird the next time you hear it, this poem will make you think, wow, that's really interesting. Why does a bird sing? I mean, I know why humans sing, but why does a bird sing? Keep going. Keen as are the arrows of that silver sphere whose intense lamp narrows in the white dawn clear until we hardly see. We feel that it's there. All the earth and air with thy voice is loud as when night is bare with one lonely cloud, the moon rains out her beams and heaven is overflowed. What thou art, we know not. What is most like thee? From rainbow clouds there flow not drops so bright to see as from thy present showers a rain of melody. Like a poet, notice all the similes, like a poet hidden in the light of thought, singing hymns unbidden till the world is wrought to sympathy with hopes and fears it heeded not. Like a high-born maiden in a palace tower, soothing her love-laden soul in secret hour with music sweet as love which overflows her bower. Like a glowworm golden in a dew of in a dell of dew, scattering unbeholden its aerial hue among the flowers and grass which screen it from the view. Like a rose embowered in its green own green leaves, by warm winds deflowered, till the scent it gives makes faint with too much sweet those heavy winged thieves. Sound of vernal showers on the twinkling grass, rain awakened flowers, all that ever was joyous and clear and fresh, thy music doth surpass. Teach us, spirit or bird, what sweet thoughts are thine. I've never heard praise of love or wine that panted forth a flood of rapture so divine. Chorus, hymnal, or triumphal chant matched with thine would be all but an empty vaunt, a thing wherein we feel there is some hidden want. What objects are the fountains of thy happy strain? Light, right, why is he singing? What's the bird singing about? What could a bird possibly be happy about? What fields or waves or mountains? What shapes of sky or plain? What love of thine own kind? What ignorance of pain? With thy clear, keen joyance, languor cannot be. Birds are never unhappy. Shadow of annoyance never came near thee. Thou lovest, but never knew love's sad satiety. Waking or asleep, thou of death must deem things more true and deep than we mortals dream. Or how could thy notes flow in such a crystal stream? And then the most famous lines, some that my seniors have pointed out maybe are the coolest lines we've read all year. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Our sweetest songs are those that tell of saddest thought. Yet if we could scorn hate and pride and fear, if we were things born not to shed a tear, I know not how thy joy we ever should come near. Better than all measures of delightful sound, better than all treasures that in books are found, thy skill to poet were, thou scorner of the ground. Teach me half the gladness that thy brain must know. Such harmonious madness from my lips would flow. The world should listen then as I am listening now. We look before and after and pine for what is not. Our sincerest laughter with some pain is fraught. Find someone laughing really hard. Shelley will say, right behind that laughter, there is a sadness. A sadness that's linked with fear, maybe? Whatever it is that's making us so happy, we're us well aware it's going to go away. You can't be happy forever. But a bird doesn't seem to know this. A bird just sings. <laughs>